Hello, my name is Rishabh and welcome to the channel The Secrets of the Universe. Today we are going to talk about the Maxwell's equations. Before I start, I want to quote a famous astronomer Carl Sagan. He said that Maxwell's equations have done more good to mankind than any 10 presidents combined. Now this line, this quote from Carl Sagan holds a lot of importance. It really tells how important these equations are. Now one thing to be noted is that Maxwell did not come up with these equations. He himself did not devise all of them. He just combined these four equations and proved that light is actually an electromagnetic wave. Maxwell's equations are the backbone of the classical electromagnetism, classical optics and modern electronics. Now, before we start, it is very important to know what is the physical meaning of the Maxwell's equations. For that, we need to understand what is the meaning of divergence and the curl. Now, divergence and curl, once we know these two concepts, it becomes very easy to understand the physical meaning of Maxwell's equations. So, let us start. And before we start, make sure you subscribe our channel because I'll keep on uploading for, uh, more videos on physics. So our first task is to understand the Gauss's law in electricity and magnetism. In order to understand these two laws, we need to understand what is the meaning of divergence of a vector field. Now any maths textbook will tell you that the mathematical formulation of divergence is this. But we need to understand the physical meaning of divergence in order to understand the Gauss's law. So we consider a vector field G depicted by these arrows. For simplicity, I'll assume that RG is only along the X direction. So we cut out these two components of the field. There is no field along the X, uh, Z direction and the Y direction. And there is no change in these fields along the Z and Y directions. Our field is only along the X direction. Now, in, uh, in our case, I have depicted that the magnitude of G is increasing along the increasing X direction in this field. Assume that the uh, strength of the field or the magnitude of the field is directly proportional to the length of the arrow. So as you can see that the arrows are here shorter but as they move along the X direction the arrows get longer. This means the strength of our field or the magnitude of the field increases. In order to understand what is divergence, what we do is we draw an arbitrary sphere of any size inside this field. It is not important to draw a sphere only. You can draw any arbitrary uh, curve around the field. As you can see, the amount of field that is entering this sphere is less as compared to what is coming outside the field. This means that there is some source that is causing the field to diverge inside the sphere. So the amount of field that is going inside is less as compared to what is coming outside. This is known as the positive divergence. Now since G has increased as it was going in the, in the X direction, we say that the derivative of G with respect to X is greater than zero and hence it is known as the positive divergence. When we plug in this value over here, in the second case, you can see that as our field is going in the x direction, the length of the arrow is decreasing. Hence, the magnitude or the strength of the field is also decreasing. To understand divergence, what we do is, we again draw an arbitrary sphere around the field. As you can see, the amount of field that is going inside this sphere is more than what is coming outside. This means that there is some sink inside that sphere that is causing our field to decrease in magnitude and hence this is known as the negative divergence. Now since G has decreased as it was going along the X direction, we say that the derivative of G with respect to X is less than zero and when we plug this over here, we will find that the divergence of G is negative. In the third case, I have shown the case of zero divergence. So what we have is, we again draw an arbitrary sphere over here. As you can see, the amount of field that is going inside is exactly equal to the amount of field that is coming outside. So this means that nothing is disturbing our field inside the sphere. There is no source 
or sink that can affect our field. Since g remains constant as it was going along x, we say that the divergence of the field in this case is exactly zero. So, having understood the physical meaning of divergence, we are ready to finally understand what the Gauss law in electricity and magnetism mean. In electricity, Gauss law, the mathematical form is this. Now, this constant is not important to understand the physical meaning of Gauss law, so we can set this to unity. This actually is there to balance the units of the equation. Rho is known as the uh, charge density and E is the electric field and this is of course the divergence. Now if I have a positive charge like this, you know that from a positive charge the electric field lines go outside like this. So I have a positive charge which is from where the electric field lines are coming out and of course I also have a negative charge which is far away from this charge, the positive charge. The electric field lines go inside like this. What Gauss's law really tells is that the divergence of electric field is directly proportional to the charge density. So if I draw an imaginary sphere around this positive charge, we can see that more field lines are going outside the sphere than what are coming inside. This means that there is a net positive charge around this sphere. So there is some source of electric field that is emanating the field outside the sphere. And now what happens in case of the negative charge? In case of the negative charge, as you can see, all the field lines are coming in this direction. So what if we draw an imaginary sphere around the negative charge? You can see that more field lines are entering this sphere than what are coming outside of this sphere. So there is some sink inside this region that is causing the uh, that is attracting all the electric field lines towards this region. Now an important property of the Gauss's law says that there can exist separate electric charges positive and negative both. Positive and ele negative electric charges are what uh, cause the electric fields. They can exist in separate, uh, they can have separate existence, the positive and the negative electric charges. But what happens when I draw a positive and a negative charge together, like this? For example, in an electric dipole, and I draw the imaginary sphere around this point. Now what will be the right hand side of this equation? It will be zero. Why? Because the positive charge contributes positive charge density and the negative charge contributes negative charge density. These two exactly cancel out each other because rho is equivalent to the net charge that is inside that region. So these two exactly cancel out each other and we get zero. In the case of magnetism, the story becomes a little bit different. What is the source of magnetic field? You will say magnet, okay? So we draw a magnet around here with the north and the south pole. We know that the magnetic field lines outside the magnet start from the north and end at the south. Like this. Now, in the case of magnetism, we again draw our imaginary sphere, like this. You can see that amount of magnetic field that is going inside this sphere is exactly equal to amount of magnetic field that is coming outside. Hence, the net divergence of magnetic field is zero. Why is this so? Because north and south pole always come in pair. One is acting as a source of magnetic field because it has positive divergence, the field lines are coming outside and the other is acting as a sink of the magnetic field because it has negative divergence, something is going in. So in the case of magnetism, the divergence of magnetic field is zero and this is what is the Gauss's law in magnetism. This also means that like the electric field, like the electricity, where we can have positive and negative charges separately. We cannot have north and south poles separately. If that was the case, that is, if I had north pole separate and south pole separate, north pole is 
giving off the magnetic field and south pole is acting as a sink to the magnetic field then the right hand side of this equation would not be zero it would be something else hence the in magnetism the gauss's law says that there can be no magnetic monopoles if you even cut a magnet into two halves you won't have a separate north and south pole what you will have is two magnets with separate pairs of north and south poles now the third one in our list is the faraday's law i personally regard this as the equation that really changed the course of history because it tells how the electric and magnetic fields are linked with each other theoretically so in order to understand what the faraday's law actually means we need to understand what is the meaning of curl so imagine we have a field again we are assuming that the length of the arrow actually signify actually signifies the uh, strength of the field so our field is stronger at the top and as we go down it is decreasing in its strength if you place a stick in here like this at the top of the stick since the field is very strong it will tend it will exert more of effect on the upper end than at the lower end so what will happen is the field the stick will tend to rotate because the amount of effect the effect that is on the upper end is more than what is at the lower end and the uh, stick will tend to rotate like this it will experience some sort of torque it will rotate and this is what actually the curl of a vector field signifies curl actually represents curl at a particular point in a vector field actually represents how much turning effect would it produce if you were present at that point so in terms of faraday's law imagine you have a round metallic ring and you pass a time varying magnetic field through it now what this time varying magnetic field will do is it will induce an electric field around this ring and when you see that the electric field has been induced it will cause the electrons to uh, flow in this uh, metallic ring and you will have a current now the negative sign signifies that the induced current is in such a direction so as to oppose a change in the magnetic field so faraday's law actually gives a relation between a changing magnetic field and the induced electric field now the last of the four equations is the ampere maxwell law the mathematical form of ampere maxwell law is this i have just excluded the uh, constants over here because we are concerned with the physical meaning of this equation the curl of the magnetic field is directly proportional to the current density over here which i have depicted with j imagine you have a current carrying wire and you draw a very small imaginary uh, circle around this wire the this equation says that around this current carrying wire the magnetic field will have a curling direction it will flow like this now there is a very prominent theoretical and experimental flaw in this equation first i'll explain the theoretical one vector calculus tells us that the divergence of curl must be zero so if i take the divergence on both sides of this equation i must have zero on both sides divergence of the curl is zero okay from the left hand side this implies that del dot j should also be zero that is the divergence of the current density should also be zero but the continuity equation in electrodynamics says that the curl of the mag uh, current density is equal to negative of the uh, rate of change of charge density this means that the divergence of current density is non zero this is a paradoxical situation because it is violating the left and right hand side of this equation left hand side is zero but the right hand side the divergence of j is non zero this was the theoretical flaw in terms of the uh, experimental flaw consider charging a capacitor now i have drawn an imaginary shape which starts from outside the uh, capacitor goes inside and ends up again over here it is a closed loop current is entering the side one but it is not leaving side two because inside the capacitor current does not flow so we have a net divergence of j 
the net divergence of j is to be considered over here this was the uh, experimental flaw the only thing that is changing inside the capacitor is the electric field as the charge is accumulating on this phase the electric field is changing inside the capacitor with time so maxwell says if we add another term 1 by c square curly e by curly t to the right hand side of the ampere's law now i'm again adding the unit over here because i've just added the unit here so he says that if you add this term on the right hand side it will perfectly balance the equation both theoretically and experimentally this term has added a beautiful symmetry to the Maxwell's equations. Faraday's law told that with the changing magnetic field with time, we had a curling electric field. Here, if you have a changing electric field with time, you have a curling magnetic field. This is the level of symmetry we have achieved in Maxwell's equations by adding this term. So this was all about the Maxwell's equations. Make sure you subscribe our channel and ask questions regarding any topic of physics. Thank you.